everyone in Japan has disappeared, and now you're trapped in a deserted city and forced to compete in deadly games where every mistake is fatal. Everything in this world is designed to kill you, but we can outsmart it with five simple rules to stay alive, and by the end, I will show you how to beat every single death game that they have to face. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the death games of Alice in Borderland. We meet this guy Arisu who's living life one game at a time. He looks like a loser, but looks can be deceiving. He's an experienced gamer, which makes him a strategist. He reads textbooks on math. He's familiar with mechanics, and this digital dexterity is impressive. Now this might look like a useless hobby, but these games train your brain to make fast and practical decisions in high pressure situations. Also, being told you're a disappointment every day by your family is going to put a serious chip on your shoulder. And sometimes you just need the right scenario to unlock that part of you. He joins his friend Karubi the bartender and Chota an IT guy. All of them have had some bad luck today and wish they could hit the reset button on their crappy lives. Karubi here imagines what they would do in a zombie outbreak and is convinced that his friend Arisu has the most potential to survive. This guy seems to understand everyone's strengths and weaknesses and this immediately makes him a leader when things go bad. He does have a massive weakness however, and that's situational awareness. As they run out of the road, the IT guy hears a loud boom from what looks like strange fireworks. The noise gets the attention of everyone else on the sidewalk, including the station police. Thinking they're in trouble, they hide in a bathroom stall. The lights go out mysteriously and don't come back on, and everything outside has gone quiet. What just happened? The friends leave the stall to find the entire city is completely abandoned, and what's even creepier is that their phones aren't even working. This is seriously unsettling, but the important thing right now is to stay calm. There's a lot of information out there because we have a whole city to ourselves. We don't know what else has disappeared, so I would scout the city to look for food, fire, water, animals, and any signs of life. We won't find all the answers, but at least we can confirm what we have to work with in this new reality. That night, a nearby building lights up with a message welcoming players to a game and guiding them to the GM building, the only place in the neighborhood with any power. Okay, we obviously shouldn't trust any of this, so I'd first want some protection. Japan has stricter gun laws, but you can buy rifles, and there's a shop right here called Shibuya Firearms Inc. only 5 minutes away from them. I'd also grab a battery powered flashlight and a backpack before investigating what's out there. They arrive to the location, but nobody is there. Now, I would scout out the perimeter of the building before entering. We have no idea what this is, and we might find out more from our surroundings. They enter the building and unknowingly pass through lasers trapping themselves inside where they find a table full of phones. They actually work, and they all have facial recognition, but they don't have any signal. This is highly suspicious. A computerized voice starts a two minute countdown waiting for other players to join. That's when this voxel lady waltzes in and drops a truth bomb. They're now players in a game and running away is not an option. This guy's ID tag got shot with a laser and it came straight down through the top of the building. But it's important to keep calm because critical thinking and observation will be more important to you than ever before. If we were cautious and been more suspicious of our surroundings, we might have expected that these lights were luring us here for a reason. We won't survive this new world without learning how to be observant of every detail, no matter how small. Another girl runs in and passes the laser grid, trapping herself in with the rest of them. If this is a game, then these are either our teammates or opponents. Now everything must be thought about in terms of competition and survival, and whoever realizes this first will have the advantage. I would immediately start looking for weaknesses in my opponents. This woman is dressed to impress, but it means she's more about perception than practicality. She also knows a lot, but doesn't seem helpful, so she won't share knowledge without a trade-off for her benefit, and all this means we can't trust her at all. They step out of the elevator into a square room with two doors, live and die, and all they have to do is pick the correct one within the time limit. It's got a difficulty rating of three of clubs, and if they win, they'll be released from the building. The IT guy starts recording from his phone. This is a great idea, because they can keep track of information as it happens, but they should have been doing this from the very beginning. The woman tells them to choose the door on the right, but doesn't give any reasoning. Now, a behavioral psychologist will look for signs of lying from shifting weight, defensive posturing, and avoiding eye contact. This woman is showing all three, so there's no way I'm walking through that door. But we should first think about the bigger picture here, which is geometry and space. We need to figure out the bounds of the arena and its rules before anything else. This is a fake ceiling. I would get on my friend's shoulders and see if I could remove the panels to get a better view. There's an obvious possibility that a trap is waiting in the next room, so I would even consider unscrewing the light bulbs and throw them into the rooms to see if they trigger anything. Smoke begins pumping through the floor. They're going to suffocate if they don't do something. The woman pressures the schoolgirl to pick a door quickly. She panics and rushes through a door, getting killed on the other side. This is a death game and the stakes are real. 
All three men are horrified, but the woman doesn't blink and picks the other door. They follow after her as the room behind explodes into flames, and this time, they have 10 seconds less. The woman tries to manipulate the others to open the next door, and Arisu here nearly falls for it, but he's too scared. The bartender Karubi decides to take a wild guess, and they run through, as the group escapes another close call. Each room is giving them less time than before, and they've been lucky so far. But unless they find a pattern here, they're all going to die. Now with deductive reasoning, we can extract quite a bit of information to help us decide which doors to choose next. We know there are at least three rows of rooms from the door patterns, from where they've been so far, and that we're on the leftmost side of the building because there are never doors on this wall. Also, the rooms are square, so the three rows can make a grid of 9 or 12 depending on the shape of the building itself. But observation here is the key to beating this thing, because if we were paying close attention to our surroundings, we would see from the evacuation map that the building is square, therefore it must be 9 rooms total. And by the process of elimination, it tells us which rooms are safe from where we've already been. Arisu here figures this out another way. Since he's a car fanatic, he remembers the model and length of the BMW downstairs and uses it to calculate the building's dimensions. He then measures the room size of his feet to extrapolate the complete layout of the game. This is the moment that hooked me into the series. Strategies like this just blow my mind. And the theory works perfectly as they make another escape until they reach the last room when he realizes something's wrong. They're in the back left corner of the building. The die door doesn't lead anywhere at all, but if they take the live door, they'll be back in the trap room where the schoolgirl died. He's completely stuck. Okay, every building is required to have a stairwell for fire escapes, and we haven't seen one yet. Based on the evacuation plan, we can be confident that the exit is to the right. But if I wasn't sure, I'd encourage the woman to open the door first. She's more likely to trust me if we made it this far, but if I'm wrong, at least it's on me or my friends that pay the price. The gamer remembers his friend was recording and asks to look. The friend's video recording confirms that there's no door on the other side of the room, and they barely make it out as the IT guy burns his leg. They finally exit the building and get a message that they've beaten the challenge. The woman finds a playing card at the Three of Clubs, and their phones say they've each earned a three-day visa, which begs the question, if they're not in Japan, where are they? Suddenly, another player walks down the alley, saying his visa expires today. The group watches as a laser falls from the sky, killing him instantly. That's when the power to the whole building shuts off again. They've got to find another game to play to extend their own visa, because if they don't, it's game over. Okay, it looks like we could be here for a while, so now is the time to start thinking about shelter, food, weapons, and lifestyle changes. Canned food is the obvious choice to start because it's quick, stores well, and there's a lot of it. But it's not going to last forever, and we'll need to learn how to hunt, cook, and garden. Long term, I would designate a nearby park to plant and harvest vegetables. Squash, potatoes, and beans are filling, high in nutrients, and easy to grow a lot of. If there's no electricity, it means no refrigerators. So cabbage will be good because it can be fermented into kimchi and stored for a nutrient-rich meal. That night at dinner, the woman tells them she's been here for three whole days, when the guys have only been here for one. So when everyone disappeared, it happened two days earlier for her. How is this possible? Arisu realizes this means time doesn't work the same way here. The IT guy thinks there might have been an EMP bomb because after he saw the explosion, the lights went out. But with all the missing people and the death lasers from the sky, we should know there is no natural explanation for any of it. Somehow we've crossed a border outside the normal world and we're playing by a different set of rules. Every game has a designer and we have to find out who that is. The only way to do that right now is to play more games to look for clues. On that note, we can't assume every game will be exactly the same. Others might be different types of challenges, and we need to be ready. Now, we can actually tell a lot from the system they chose. This was the Three of Clubs, which is a low card, so it tells me there are a lot more games to play, and they're going to get a lot harder. I would be training to improve my conditioning, work on improving memory functions and observational skills and calming techniques like I was in a Marsoc Special Forces boot camp. And for a gamer who sits in a chair 14 hours a day, this is a major adjustment that needs to be worked on immediately. Later that night, the two friends make a plan. They'll join a game hoping to win and buy time to find a doctor for their friend's leg. This IT guy is an asset, but if he doesn't heal, he could get them all killed in a game. This is why friends shouldn't enter games with each other, because there might be serious injuries that affect the group, or even games that only have one winner. If we split up, we can all be winners and learn from each other about the other games. Mining information faster is how we all survive and thrive. They join the game where they get new phones and see a lot more competitors than last time. This one is going to be intense. This guy is even using the electricity that charges music player, which is smart to take advantage of the electricity while we have it. But those old cassette players are battery powered. Something suspicious is going on there. These guys look battle tested and have probably been here for a really long time. I would try to learn everything I can from them to better adjust to this place, because people and knowledge are the most valuable resources here. They're also the most dangerous. The game is a five of spades. The number represents its difficulty, while the suit represents what kind of challenge it is. In this case, it's a game where physical ability has the advantage. A player tells them clubs represent team battles, diamonds are challenges of intellect, and hearts involve games of trust and betrayal. 
This one is a game of tag. Everyone must run away from the attacker and they've got 20 minutes to find a safe zone before the building explodes. They all spread out looking for a strategy as the tagger reaches the top floor and begins the hunt. Now this guy wants to funnel players downwards because there's a laser blocking the exit below and a chase is always easier downhill. That's exactly why I would position myself at the top floor in the corner near this pole because I can slide down or climb up quickly and I can access it from every floor. It also leads me to the roof which keeps me completely safe. These guys check the rooms for a safe zone, but they're all locked. They hear gunfire upstairs and peek around the corner, narrowly dodging a stream of bullets. The guys run and hide behind a wall as the killer continues downstairs. It's risky, but this is the perfect time to strike. We can't run forever, and the majority of this building works in his favor because they're long, narrow hallways. But the stairwells give us the advantage because he can't shoot around corners. I would sneak up behind and push him down the stairs and into the wall. He'll probably put his arms out to stop his fall, and it might free the gun, giving us a chance to grab it. The gunman goes on a killing spree, taking a few more contestants out as the two friends move to a better vantage point. The killer turns in their direction, but doesn't see them, and the gamer realizes the mask impairs his vision. Now they know his weakness. The gamer yells to the other players that if they call out his location, they can find the safe zone as a team and stop the bomb. This girl is the first to try, as she yells out the killer's location and climbs up to the next level. This girl is scaling the building like a freaking ninja. The bartender wants to ambush the killer and this guy agrees. He's also a tactical genius because he's able to figure out the killer's height, weight, and level of training just from watching him. But Arisu here notices something else. Both this soldier and his henchmen have locker key wrist straps. Even though this is a life and death situation, this little detail is important because it might mean they have valuable things to lock up and hide. If either of them dies, I'm coming back and taking it off their wrists. The climber girl offers to help check the first and second floor for the killer and jumps down. The gamer goes looking for the safe zone with the climber girl's help, while the soldier and the bartender plan to ambush the killer. It's a good plan, because the killer will be distracted away from the main objective and they can beat the game. This guy lures him out of the stairwell, but the soldier doesn't come to help, and the guy gets shot to death. He's devious. He was waiting so the killer would empty his magazine. Suddenly, the soldier sprays the killer with a fire extinguisher, dodging a wild spray of bullets, and now he's out of ammo. They take turns fighting him, and this killer is tough, even taking several stabs from the bartender like it's nothing, and he slices a bloody wound into the man's side. Meanwhile, Arisu here tries to figure out where the safe zone is and spots a door the killer shot at. It doesn't make sense that the gunman would shoot from so far away unless he's protecting something. He's also not the only one who realizes this as another player shows up. It's the same guy with the music player. Arisu here slowly opens the door and takes a look inside. A quick note, if I'm opening this door, I'm doing it from the other side because I don't know what's coming out of there. It doesn't hurt to have some metal in front of you until you can confirm there's no threat. Inside they spot a door and investigate, but there's another killer and the two survivors have to run. But the player slams a taser into his side and the killer collapses. Earlier what we saw was him actually charging his taser, which he made from scratch. This guy is really clever, but it wasn't enough to keep him down. He runs into a room and realizes he's now trapped in the safe zone where he sees two buttons to stop the bomb, but both must be pressed at the same time. He yells at the location of the safe zone and that he needs a hand. Now, I would still give this a shot. I can't stretch far enough, but I could take off my shoes and throw them hard at the buttons to beat the game. The killer breaks in and Arisu here tries to fight him off. Luckily, the climber chick hops through the window and stuns him with the stranger's disguised taser. With one second left, they jump for the buttons, making it just in time. The killer takes her mask off and looks terrified as the collar suddenly explodes. These killers were actually players, and they were playing against us for their survival. Downstairs, the bartender finds a walkie-talkie on a dead player and hears two phrases, the answer is in our hands, and return to the beach. And he's not the only one looting. This guy finds a note on the killer with a strange design. It's not clear what this means, but this is a lot more important than you might think. I would definitely be checking every dead body for anything useful, or maybe even something I can learn from them. Every piece of information is valuable, especially when answers are so hard to come by. The friends return with a warm welcome. They're grateful to be alive, and the group discuss what to do with the information the bartender heard on the walkie-talkie. Okay, this thing is really useful, because we can now listen in on our opponents. We need to use everything to gain a competitive advantage over others. They might talk about game strategies or food and weapon storage locations. All this information could make the difference between life and death. The next night, the group leave for Shibuya to enter another game, hosted at the Shinjuku Botanical Garden, and this one's gonna be unlike any other. They walk in and see a table of weapons and some high-tech headsets. Okay, if there's only four people here and they're laying out weapons, I'm thinking this isn't going to go well for any of us. But when push comes to shove and you have to kill, weapon selection is important here. It needs to be light enough to wield and run with, but also very sturdy. It also doesn't say you can't choose two. I would pick the hammer and the hand axe. Both are single hand weapons, easy to swing, and neither of them will break from heavy impact. 
When they put on the goggles, the headsets lock around their necks and turn on, recognizing the players with an advanced eye tracking feature. The game they will be playing is simple. Hide and seek. Difficulty, seven of hearts. And we know hearts are about trust and betrayal. This is about to get real ugly. One person will be the wolf, the rest lambs, and whoever finds the wolf becomes the new one. However, to win this game, you must be the wolf by the end of 15 minutes. Whoever is a lamb afterwards will die. Okay, this is terrifying, and trust is so important here. As soon as I see that this is a game of hearts, I'm keeping a close eye on this woman. We saw her throw someone under the bus in the first game, and she'll do it again if we aren't paying attention. The first wolf is Chota, the IT guy, and tries to remove the collar, but is warned he might explode if he does. He turns and makes eye contact with Arisu here, and suddenly he becomes the wolf. Realizing the pattern, this woman gets everyone's attention, tricking Arisu to look at her. She steals the wolf roll and runs away. The wolf is not the hunter, but the hunted, because only the wolf will be alive by the end of the game. The bartender chases her, but he's too far behind. She ducks behind a bush to hide from the man, trying to stay the wolf until time runs out. This girl is all about survival, but she needs a better strategy to hide, because she's wearing heels, which make distinctive marks that they could use to track her down. If I was the wolf, I might consider climbing a tree. Nobody can lock eyes with me even if they climb up to get me, and I can kick them down when they try. The bartender finds her and doesn't hold back, but the woman slams a rock into his wound and they end up making eye contact. Now he is the wolf, except his friend arrives and locks gazes with him. He gets cornered by the two of them who fail to convince him to switch roles. This is why they call it a hearts game, because the game designers want you to choose between your life or your friends. There might not be a way for all of us to win, but we have to try. This is a botanical garden and there's water here, so maybe if we all look at the same point in the water at our reflections, everyone's headset will register eye contact, turning us all into wolves and we'll all survive. The woman goes to attack him, but his injured friend tackles her to the ground and tells him to run. Arisu here dashes off to hide and tries to remove the headset. He's about to clip it when he remembers seeing the colors explode in the previous game and refuses to go out like a coward. Kuruba here is distraught and starts hunting for his friend. Arisu here is very emotional, but he doesn't want them to go out fighting and tells them he will sacrifice himself. The bartender hears this and has a change of heart. Since the very beginning, he always knew his friend Arisu had the most potential of them all and he must survive. The gamer tries to find them, but they've all gone silent. He finally finds his friend, but by then, it's too late. His color explodes, leaving Arisu here the sole survivor and lucky winner of this death game. This is the worst possible outcome, but keep in mind these games won't stop. I'm taking all of these weapons back with me. This is seriously tragic, but if I were Arisu here, I would channel my grief and rage into the games. From now on, I'm building a pre-built strategy for each suit of cards and training every day so that this never happens again. Workouts, aerobic endurance, solving riddles, and building a new team I can trust? This is what I'm focused on. That way my friends won't die in vain and I get more time on my visa. The climber girl from the tag game finds the gamer lying in the street and looking miserable, so she takes him back to her shelter for food and a pep talk. Even though she's been through her own hardships, she still keeps going and he should too. Whether he's ready or not, his visa will expire today and they both must join another game to stay alive. That night, the two of them head to the next game in this tunnel, where they find a bus in the road. Inside, there are three other men on board and one of them has an injured leg. They find out this game is called Distance, with a difficulty of four of clubs, and clubs is a team game. Now his injured leg is looking like it might put them all at risk if he can't contribute. Their phones tell them to reach their goal in two hours and shows a distance counter which starts at zero. This is the time to explore the parameters of the game. I would walk both backwards and forwards to see how the steps are counted to get a clear indication of which direction the goal is. One of the other players realizes that this older bus doesn't need electricity to start, so they could drive to their goal. Unfortunately, there's no gas, so they'll have to run. The injured man tells his friend to go on without him, reassuring them that he'll find his own way to survive and they leave. Personally, I hate running, so I would have spent a little more time investigating gas options closer to the bus, maybe even pushing it to the next car so we don't waste time going back. We also don't know how far away the goal is, so this bus might be our only option. If this is a clubs game, I'm inclined to strategize as a group, so I might have them all scout the tunnel to find gasoline or other working cars with keys left inside. By the time they reach 5,000 meters, they're exhausted. Okay, this is already a clear sign that you're doing something wrong. So far, you're physically drained and you're not working as a team. And if this is a clubs game, then you need to rethink your approach because the strategy needs to match the card suit. They push forward, making good time on their jog, but then they see something coming in the distance and realize it's a panther. They split up, dodging underneath cars and behind doors as one of the guys gets mauled to death. They find a flare inside of a car and manage to scare it off, but they have to keep going. Managing to escape, the remaining survivors see a truck with a Royal Enfield on it, a motorbike that uses diesel fuel and can be started without electricity. They don't have the key, but the gamer realizes that if they can take this back to the bus, they can refuel it and take the injured player straight to the goal. The girl and the player keep going while Risu here runs back with the motorbike. 
Diesel engines use compression ignition, and gas-powered cars use a spark plug to ignite the fuel, but they can still use regular gas to power diesel cars. So using this motorcycle was a great idea, but it's also completely unnecessary. The other two have made it to the end, only to find the steel wall leaking out water, and it's about to burst. They're doomed. This is no joke. Water like this can crush you quickly, because one liter weighs a full kilogram. I would have jumped in the car because the steel frame could protect me, and I might be carried down the tunnel. The man trips and gets caught in the incoming flood, leaving the climber to her impending death. But then she sees the bus in the distance. Arisu over there has managed to refuel it and leans out to catch her arm. She grabs onto him in the nick of time as the waters tip the vehicle over, knocking them out. When they climb out of the bus, they see that it was the goal this whole time. Those numbers were indicating how far away they were from it. Now, if we had looked for the gas tank door to begin with, we would have seen the giant sign that says goal. But even if we missed that, pushing the bus to the next car for gas would show the distance meter remaining at zero, giving us clear indication that we're fine exactly where we are. Outside, the gamer tells her about a place called the beach his friend heard about on the walkie-talkie and proposes they look for it. They don't exactly know what to expect, but they're bound to find some answers. But I gotta say, if I figured all this out about diesel cars, you can be damn sure I'm not gonna be riding a bike anymore. Leaving the greater Tokyo area, they're further from the convenience of the city. They're low on supplies, and the gamer has three days on his visa. They spend the night in the park, and the girl teaches him how to hunt and track wild boar. There's a lot we can learn from this girl. She's a survivor, and has more experience in nature, climbing, hunting, camping, and cooking. We need to learn as much as we can, because you never know when you might lose another friend. I would also be scouting all the possible venues of my new surroundings, because the more familiar we are with them, the more advantage we will have in the games, like places to hide or tactical positioning. That night, he spies a group of participants about to play a death game and realizes these players are all wearing locker keys on their wrists, just like those guys in the tag game. Something is going on and they have to get to the bottom of it. This is clearly an organized society of players and I wouldn't trust any of them. Life and death scenarios bring out the worst in groups because they collectively take advantage of others, finding ways to blackmail and trap you in. They follow them to a hotel that surprisingly has running power, unlike everywhere else in the city. But as they're spying, someone sneaks up from behind and knocks them out. I would really try to be a little more secretive about it. I would have taken the locker bracelet from the killer in the tag game and used it to try passing as a member to find out more. They wake up to these people in swimsuits interrogating them. The gamer admits they're here to find answers and this guy Hatter claims he has them as he reveals this wall lined with giant playing cards. He explains that if they clear the games and get all the cards, one lucky person can go back to the normal world. This is why the beach was created, to form a giant team of players to collect cards and they have no choice but to join up. I'm not buying it. What if a single person needs to earn all 52 cards himself in order to escape? This rule isn't advertised and they simply don't know. Groups like this aren't interested in governance or equality or representation. It's always about power and survival. Don't get involved. This is fool's gold. And the truth is, the more people around you, the more to stab you in the back. On the plus side, these guys have fuel, electricity, water, and guns. So if we're caught, we should take advantage. They have three rules. Everyone must wear swimsuits, as that way no weapons can be hidden. Any cards won in the game will be taken, and if anyone breaks the rules or betrays the mission, they'll be executed. They want to test Arisu here to see what he's made of, and this scientist woman is here to observe his decision making. The group enter this room filled with water and a massive transformer above them. The name of the game is Lightbulb. Difficulty, four of diamonds. The goal, find out which of these three switches turns on this light, but you can only flip one switch with the door open. However, if someone is in the room with the bulb, the door won't close. They can only answer once, and if they get it wrong or the water touches these electrical wires, they die. The water begins to rise and Arisu here isn't sure what to do, but he thinks he can eliminate a wrong answer easily by flipping the first switch with the door open. The problem is, if it doesn't turn on, the door will close and they won't be able to confirm which of the remaining switches works. The lady challenges him, is it worth risking all their lives on chance? The water is up to their waists and they have no time to argue, so Arisu over here goes to flip A, but he thinks about what's been said. There's one chance to keep the door open to confirm if the light is on or not and he has an idea. They close the door first and flip switch A, then flip switch B with the door open. No light. He has the player touch the bulb and it's hot. Switch A is the answer. Arisu here solves a puzzle in the nick of time and he's proven his worth. There is one thing they didn't think of though. This game gave them phones with waterproof cases and we saw in the first game that they can record video. I would put the phone in the room and face it at the light, close the door and flip every switch, recording the sequence on the phone to tell which one the light is. All players return to the beach and the leader wants to talk with the gamer. He's impressed by his wit and invites him to a meeting with the executives. In the meeting, the leader brings up that he needs to renew his visa and the soldier shares a look with his men. These people are dangerous and it looks like there's a rivalry that we do not want to get in the middle of. And if I'm a Risu here, I don't want to be caught in someone else's drama because if we get close to someone else's enemy, then we put our lives at risk. 
The strategic move is to stay low, stay humble, and wait for your chance to slip out unnoticed and forgotten. The next day, the girl warns the gamer that the militants are keeping an eye on them and they start thinking about escape. He goes around asking different people what they know about this world and learns that there might be lasers surrounding the entire country. He scouts at the compound and hears gunshots. Around a corner, he sees some of the militants near a dumpster. Waiting for them to leave, he peeks inside and finds a pile of dead bodies. Then a stranger shows up, the same person from the game Attack. He explains that this is what happens when you betray the beach and wants to do something about it. He has a proposal for the gamer, steal all the cards from the leader and leave this place for good. It's a dangerous plan, but he feels he must do something. The gamer agrees and tells his friend the plan. Luckily, she knows where the guns are stored, but they're heavily guarded. Later, he's called to an urgent meeting and finds out that the leader of the beach is dead. He died from a bullet wound, and they all wondered, did he die from the games or was he murdered? The militants threaten the others to elect the soldier, Agony, and they have no choice. This is the time to steal the cards and escape. Arisu here is upstairs looking for the safe, and after finding it, it inputs the code that this guy tells him, but it doesn't open. The militants catch him in the act. This was all a part of this guy's plan. The gamer was being used to find out where the actual safe is being kept in the room. We should know that all people shouldn't be trusted and everyone is dangerous. There's also a better way to escape. In the beach's regime change, everyone would be distracted enough for two involuntary members to escape. I would be looking for that opportunity more than worrying about the legacy of a place I don't even want to be in. Arisu is gagged and bound in a room. He's going to be here until his visa expires and no one will be coming to rescue him. Meanwhile, the stranger returns to open the real safe, finding the box of all the playing cards collected. The girl gets dragged into a room by the second in command and this guy is ready to do some terrible things, when luckily, the power in the entire resort goes off. Confused, they all look around and find a game sign in the room. All the exits to the beach have been closed off with lasers. The entire hotel has become the arena for a whole new game. Difficulty, 10 of hearts, the last remaining numeral card. Everyone rushes to the lobby to grab a phone, but in the middle of the chaos, the girl sees a woman has been stabbed and everyone goes quiet. The game is called Witch Hunt and they have two hours to discover who killed the girl and burn them to death. The members interrogate the dead girl's friend. They find it suspicious that she wasn't with her since they're practically inseparable. She claims she was in her room, but they don't believe her and get ready to burn her at the stake. And she's saved when the executive members step in. Okay, this is a classic whodunit and we have some information to work with here. First of all, this is a hearts game, the most dangerous kind because the game maker wants everyone to turn on each other. And that's exactly why we can't do that. There might be an obvious choice, but it also might be a trick of the game. Now, this girl was stabbed with an ordinary knife and all the militants have firearms and samurai swords. We also know where they dumped the dead, so I don't think it's them. The best answers are with the friend because we can learn about any behavioral changes or if someone was stalking her or even if she was being blackmailed to do something. They all start accusing each other when the soldier Agony finally steps in and threatens to kill everyone if the real witch doesn't step forward. His second in command fires his gun and sends the crowd scattering. Okay, the key to winning here is to understand the game maker's design. They will play tricks on the mind and have you so focused on your own survival that you don't see the big picture. So first we have to consider if there's a way where no one has to die at all. Now we already conveniently have a dead body. I would throw her into the fire first to eliminate every possibility before extreme measures are taken. The girls run away to look for the gamer who is still tied up. Meanwhile, the swordsman is pouring gasoline in the basement. They're going to burn this place to the ground. The dreadlock girl finds the forensic scientist snooping around. She's looking for super glue to get prints off the murder weapon, which is really smart. But I would tell her to find out where the knife came from and find out who's been there recently instead. The second in command gets into a face off with a shady guy who points out the power supply at the beach has changed since this witch hunt started, meaning someone working for the game has infiltrated the resort to switch the power. And the only people who have access to the power supply are the executives. The shady guy rushes the gunman and sets him on fire with a DIY flamethrower. Meanwhile, Arisu here scrapes the tape off his mouth and calls out for help. Luckily, his friend hears him crying and tracks him down to this door. She rescues him and catches him up to speed. He thinks the witch is also a player in their own game, having to kill the girl and stay undetected. That's when he realizes he's looking at this the wrong way. He should be thinking like the game designer. They knew the leader died and used the chaos to set this game up. The witch could have moved the victim's body an hour before this all started, and he thinks he knows who it is. There are 50 minutes remaining and the witch still hasn't been found. The remaining members are cornered in the lobby where the leader orders his men to kill everyone, but they're stopped when the gamer arrives. They know he's not the witch because he's been tied up the whole time. He begs the leader to work together to find the murderer and gets attacked. Surprisingly, the soldier confesses that he's the witch and Orisu calls him a liar. But he knows the soldier did kill someone and it wasn't the girl, it was Hatter, the beach's old leader. The soldier's eyes tell him all he needs to know. The night Hatter went to renew his visa, the soldier shot him in self-defense. 
Orisu here has figured out there's one way to beat this game without killing anyone, and that's if the girl killed herself. This revelation makes the new leader outraged as he starts fighting everyone, but they're running out of time and must put an end to this before they all die. The witch's friend knows a way to stop this and getting everyone's attention announces that she's the dealer of this game. A laser pierces through her head and kills her instantly, shocking the beach into silence. Okay, what the hell is a dealer? There's clearly some things that others know about this game that we don't, and she just got killed for telling us. The forensic scientist appears and confirms that the murdered girl did in fact kill herself because the fingerprints had a reverse grip on the knife. Then someone starts shooting at them. It's the second in command still alive. He fires into the crowd, but his rampage is stopped by the soldier, taking several bullets as he picks him up and carries him into the smoke. With three minutes remaining, the group carries the witch's body to the fire and they all clear the game, watching as the beach resort burns up. But the shady guy comes back inside to add the 10 of hearts to his collection. All that's left are the face cards and it will be a complete set. The next day, the gamer and the climber girl look for answers. On it, they find a confession that they were both dealers, a group specially chosen to set up the games, sometimes acting as taggers or pretending to be other players, and they'll be killed if anyone finds out who they actually are. There must be other people who are dealers pretending to be players. This really sheds a new light on everything we've seen. Maybe this chick was a dealer and wanted to make sure everyone was killed in the hearts game. And this guy who willingly stayed on the bus and insisted his friends leave was actually a dealer who set up the game for his own benefit. We need to be more suspicious of others than ever before. In one of the videos, the two girls go through the subway and reveal the dealer's secret base. It's a massive surveillance room where others like them watch the games, and just like the players, these dealers have to play games for their visas too. They trace the girl's step navigating the metro tunnels and find the door to the secret base has been opened. Someone has gotten here before them, find the dealers are dead and their computers powered down. That's when the shady guy and the dreadlock girl find them. He realized the drawing on the note he found was actually a route map of this subway station and came here to find out what happens when they get all the carts, but instead found these people dead and concludes that there's someone above the dealers who is controlling the games. The computer screens suddenly turn on for a special urgent broadcast, and to everyone's surprise, it's presented by one of the beach's executives. She worked for the games this whole time. She congratulates all the players for their victory and announces there's a prize courtesy of her team. Tomorrow at noon, there will be a new round of games, but this time they're playing for the face cards. They now begin to see there's a grand design to this whole thing, and this woman has the answers they're looking for. As they make their way outside, they look up and see a giant blimp carrying a massive king of spades. Citywide, more of these zeppelins fly in with face cards of their own, and the next stage has officially begun. But what do you think? How would you beat the deaf games in Alice in Borderlands? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.